with the tour on Hilton Head Island this week, worth a look back at a guy who knows this course better than most. Jim Furyk, winner of the RBC Heritage in 2010, a playoff with Brian Davis. You may remember Davis called a two-stroke penalty on himself, which gave Furyk the win. Five years later, Furyk shot a final round 63 before defeating Kevin Kisner in a playoff at the 2015 RBC Heritage. Furyk 63 was the lowest final round posting of an eventual winner in the tournament's history and helped him claim his first win since the 2010 Tour Championship. And when you see Jim Furyk's career results at the RBC Heritage, all you can think is cha-ching. In 24 <laughs> starts, he's made 3.8 mil plus, has had eight top tens, including those two dubs. And Jim Furyk has had four wins in playoffs in his career on the PGA Tour. 50% of them came at the RBC Heritage. We now have 17-time PGA Tour winner Jim Furyk with us, who's playing this week at the Invited Classic on the PGA Tour Champions in Irving, Texas. Jim, let's start with the RBC Heritage, obviously, an event you've won twice. Back in 2010, it was your second win that season. At that time, could you sense this could be a monster year? Uh, I was hoping so. I was hoping. It had been a, little, a few years since I'd won, I believe, 2010. Uh, I felt good about my game, but I think really Valspar was a was a springboard for me to kind of get that win, get the monkey off my back, and I was a little bit more relaxed for the rest of the year and and really kind of got on a roll. That uh, obviously my probably the most successful best year of my season, and you know culminated with winning the Tour Championship and then Player of the Year. So uh, exciting year for me, and uh, at a time when I was supposed to be kind of I think on a on a little bit of a downslide at 40 years old. So uh, kind of nice to uh, to have a nice year late in your career. And Jim, I want to stay with 2015 and that second championship at Harvard Town. And I recall on 18 a lot of emotion from you because it had been a few years between big time wins like that for you. What do you recall from that glorious week in Harvard Town, that second go around with a win? Um, you know, 2010 was fun. I had Tabitha and both the kids there. 15, I was uh, on my own that week. Uh, we were running uh, the Furyk and Friends, which has now become the Constellation Furyk and Friends, right in behind that. So. We had a party that evening on Sunday, and I'll say, uh, you know, showing up with a tartan jacket, yeah. showing up to our cocktail party, our concert. Uh, we had a massive thunderstorm, and Stuart Sink and I uh, hopped in a car and and drove all the way to the event. So uh, it was really, uh, I guess, kind of the first one I got to share with my family and Tab and the kids, which was really cool. And the second one I shared with basically most of Jacksonville, who was at our event having a good time at the concert. <laughs> It doesn't sound like too bad either option. Jim, so much of your career was predicated off of precision off the tee, exacting iron play, consistency to lead to 17 PGA Tour wins. Jim Furyk 2.0. If he was turning pro in 2024 and so much has been made about the distance debate and the rollback, could he compete on the PGA Tour? You know, when I when I went to college, I was actually long and wild, uh, believe it or not. I was a long hitter uh, as an 18 to 19 year old. Um, I felt like at that time to become a more consistent player, a better player, I wanted to kind of ramp it back. I wanted to uh, hit more fairways, and that was a that was a key when I went to the PGA Tour. Uh, you know, I don't have any statistics to back it up, but we were hitting a lot more 180, 190, 200 yard shots to greens. Well, you know what, back then that was five iron, you know, and, and you weren't hitting greens from 190 out of the rough at a thick rough uh, from that distance. You know, at that time I was trying to take a seven iron, play it back in my stance, try to get it to jump and, and hop it on the green. So really I felt like in order to become a better player on the PGA tour, I had to kind of dial it back a little bit and hit a lot more fairways. And that was a big key for me in my first five years on the PJ tour to, to becoming a more successful player. Now, no chance, right? You're going to, um, guys are so big, so strong. And I'm going to start with the athlete, the athletes, bigger, stronger, faster. The equipment is bigger, stronger, faster. So now, even though the golf courses are longer, uh, even at 500 yard par fours, these guys aren't hitting a lot of five irons, uh, in the greens. They're hitting a lot of short irons in the greens and, uh, statistics will tell you that, you know, we're going to launch it and we're going to go find it. And even if we're in the rough, we're going to play better from there than, than, uh, you know, the shorter players. And uh, you know what, when these guys get on, when they're driving it, well, you know, when Rory's driving it down the middle at, you know, 330 yards, he's hard to beat when Scotty Scheffler's driving it and bombing it, but hitting a lot of fairways as he does, he's hard to beat. And, uh, you know, when they're on, uh, they're going to shoot some low numbers and when they're not, 
uh, statistics still show you that you know they're better off in the rough and, and closer to the green. Jim, let's talk about low numbers. Uh, nobody knows low numbers better than you do, my friend. Uh, still, the record stands as the only guy on the PGA Tour to break 60 twice with a 58 and a 59, and nobody's gone as low as you did in that final round of the Travelers in 2016, posting a 58. Uh, we're never going to experience <laughs> this, George, so I might as well ask you, what's it feel like to be in that type of groove, my friend? <laughs> uh, a lot of fun. I guess you can call it the zone, whatever you want to say about it, but... You know, being a guy that was known for, I guess, tough golf courses and grinding out pars, um, you know, I, I still, I look back early in my career, I won in Vegas three times at 25 under, 28 under, 29 under. I think I was comfortable with both formats, but uh, really cool to be able to do it again, kind of later in my career at the age of 43 and 46, shooting the 59 and 58. But, uh, you know, it, it's, I like to say it's not any different than breaking 90, 80, 70 for the first time. Uh, I never really considered having the opportunity to to break 60 on the PJ Tour, but uh, you know, luckily I got a couple opportunities. I made the most of it, and uh, really kind of had to pinch myself in the middle of those back nines both times, and and basically tell myself to enjoy it. I mean, have a great time. You don't get these opportunities very often. Let's have fun with it, and and uh, let's be aggressive. And if you're going to go down, let's go down in flames. Let's go down being aggressive. Yeah, uh, certainly a Hall of Fame moment for a guy who inexplicably is not one yet, but certainly will be. Um, and I, I want to follow back on that because you talk about the athletes, Jim, and, and, and how golf has just changed, but nobody's gotten that low again. Are you surprised by that, that nobody else has gotten to that 58 number? It seems there's a few watches every year. You know, uh, I get messages when, when, when there is a – a 50s watch uh, friends start texting uh you know I, it pops up on my phone whatever it may be um there are a certain number of courses i think on the pj tour now that have you know maybe gotten a little bit short um that guys always tend to scare that number with and and have even broke 60 on so uh, it's going to happen i mean i think mr guyberger i believe had a had the record or had a piece of that record for about 37 years you know if it could go that long that would be awesome if, if no one broke 58 for the next 37 years that would be incredible but i think it's going to happen a lot sooner and and uh you know uh, i think the game's just changed so much the athletes gotten better the teaching mechanisms mechanisms have gotten better and uh it, it's going to happen but i'm going to enjoy it while it lasts I'm guessing this isn't like a 72 Dolphins thing where you have the champagne on ice every time there's a sub-60 watch. But we'll, we'll see if that day happens down the road. Jordan was saying, I mean, you have credentials that stack up with guys we already see in the Hall of Fame. When you look at your career resume, do you feel that you should be in the Hall of Fame? Um, it's funny how I get at I actually more and more now keep getting asked that. I, I, I mean, it's a no-win situation. Um, but I, I guess if you're going to be blunt and ask the question, I guess I have to be blunt and answer it. Uh, I, I agree. I think there's uh, there's some folks, uh, there's quite a few folks in the Hall of Fame where my, my record stacks up. I think it's as good or better. And and uh, but but ultimately, that's really not my decision. I think uh, just keep. I like to. I still enjoy playing the game. I still enjoy practicing to get better. And um, I was on that finals list uh, the last time around, and, and hopefully, we'll be the next. Well, Jim, thanks so much for the time this week. Best of luck at the Invited Classic. And, of course, we'll be checking in with you throughout the year leading up to the President's Cup later this fall in Montreal. I'm excited about leading uh, the U.S. team and uh, keeping an eye. I usually don't watch a ton of golf, but I will admit that uh, I'm glued to the TV a lot of Sundays and rooting for, uh, you know, I root for everyone, but I'm really rooting for the American guys that have an opportunity to make the team. And, and uh, it's been exciting to watch. We had some great finishes at the Masters last week. Yeah, I can uh, certainly imagine you got you got some good options at the top of that American <laughs> team. Play well this week. I appreciate it, guys. Nice being on with you.